Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome international journalist and author Riz Khan. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to this wonderful session we've got lined up for you now coming up over the next 45 minutes. Um, as you can see, I'm trying to go eco-friendly, paper-free with my aging eyes. I'm not sure it was such a good idea, but I'll try and get through this. Uh, I'm Riz Khan. As the voice of God said just now, uh, I'm an international uh, journalist, and uh, I had an interview show on CNN International for, uh, for many years. And before you start mumbling fake news, I should point out I'm now a freelance. Uh, so it's more a case of scrape news, as you know, I try to scrape some real news out there somewhere. It's not easy to find the real story. Uh, by the way, I love the fact the voice of God is actually a woman for a change and someone with a lovely voice too. Uh, my mother used to say to me, when God made man, she was only joking. So I'm glad we're, uh, we're showing some equality here. The RSA conference is, of course, uh, an excellent event. It's a remarkable scale and size that illustrates the, the importance that uh, digital technology and the cyber world is to us right now. We live in a world where you know, your doctor tells you you can find your diagnosis and test results on his Twitter feed and that uh, your friends can follow your colonoscopy on uh, Facebook. So nothing is sacred anymore. It's all out there. And our relationship with technology is a very, uh, very much like a marriage. Uh, it, it, it's a serious commitment. Um, and it can prove to be very challenging and also very rewarding, but of course, our relationship with technology is a serious commitment, like a marriage. Uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu of South Africa uh, was famous for being interviewed one time, and it was his 50th wedding anniversary, and his, um, uh, the interviewer said to him, you know, Archbishop Tutu, you've been married for 50 years. That's a long time. In all those 50 years, have you ever contemplated divorce? And he said, divorce, never. But murder, now sadly we don't have that option with our technology and, and divorce is not an option from the way we use it. So uh, things can go wrong like anything and it it's not always a smooth ride. So what happens when essentially there is that kind of threat? And what about when your country is, is threatened? Well, I guess this afternoon um, had himself a rather difficult position when the country he was charged with running uh, found itself grinding to a halt in what was arguably the first major cyber attack of its kind on an entire nation. Suddenly in April 2007, this northern European nation on the shores of the Baltic Sea went from being Estonia to E-Estonia. He was prime minister then and uh, has gone on to become uh, a European commissioner for digital single market as well as the vice president of the European Commission. I'll chat with him in just a short while and we can talk more about the issues that uh, he's faced and how things have moved on as we face the challenge of digital security. But please give a very warm welcome to the former Prime Minister of Estonia, Andrus Ansip. Thank you, Minister. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure to be with you today. Many thanks for inviting me to San Francisco. When it comes to cyber attacks, you could say my experience is somehow special. Estonia is a small Baltic nation on the edge of Europe. We not only share a border with Russia, we also have a long and difficult history together. In 2007, I was Prime Minister of Estonia. Over the three weeks, my country was the target of an orchestrated uh, cyber campaign to destabilize parts of uh, our online presence and civilian infrastructure. It was a watershed moment. I learned a lot of lessons in 2007. The main one was that uh, there is uh, no substitute for informal and rapid information exchange internally and with our allies. That is how Estonia got through its cyber crisis, thanks to the support of others, including the United States. Realistically, no country can succeed alone. Now, I'm using that experience uh, at the European Commission in Brussels uh, 
where I am responsible for creating a digital single market for the European Union. In 2007, cyber attacks were used as a weapon to achieve political goals. This was a strong signal to the whole world uh, that cyberspace uh, would very likely be used in the future to attack independent countries. Since then, we have seen many other countries have been on the receiving end. Malicious cyber activity has proliferated. It has become more brazen and sophisticated, more imaginative and international. Misinformation is another widely used tool of political influence. In Russia, for example, military doctrine sees a cyber operations as part of its tactics for information warfare. Deception, false data, and destabilizing propaganda are deemed legitimate tools uh, to convince people to buy uh, the disinformation message as a credible information. It is a sad truth, but if you repeat false information often enough, sooner or later some people start to accept it as true. Three years ago, EU leaders decided they had had enough, and so a special team was set up to improve Europe's forecasting and uh, response uh, to pro-Kremlin information weaponizing. In its first two years, it identified more than 3,500 examples that contradicted publicly available facts. Here are some from the last month that name uh, the United States directly. Take this one. Americans poisoned Russian ex-spy Skripal and taught her to spread Russophobia. That came from the 60 Minutes program broadcast by the Russia 24 channel. It is owned by the Russian state. Or this one from NTV, controlled by Gazprom Media. The US intelligence services are planning to kill one of the presidential candidates uh, in Russia. Both examples push a conspiracy theory, but with no evidence to back it up. And it continues today, multiplied across many languages and repeated daily. A huge propaganda machine. Who would be in a position to pay for that if not a garment? In Europe, as in the United States, we remain on the front lines of these assaults on democracy, threatening to undermine institutions. A welcome development in this cyber gloom is that there is now more willingness to name perpetrators, even if it concerns a specific country rather than individuals. Given the scale and scope of the threats, people should name names if they can. Collective attribution makes us stronger against the threats wherever it is from. The world faces a new strategic environment, one where we should help each other even more. To me, it is why the EU-US partnership needs to stay strong for security and prosperity of both sides of the Atlantic. On cybersecurity, Europe is already working with the United States. 
I would like to see more cooperation, perhaps to explore the idea of a secure transatlantic uh, cyber area to deter uh, cyber attackers. For example, we have proposed EU certification for cybersecurity products and services. This should be a good basis to discuss and make sure that our cyber standards are aligned on both sides of the Atlantic. If both sides could agree on common security standards for the Internet of Things, this would set a global standard. Exchanging detailed information about cyber incidents will help to prevent future attacks. We are in the, in the same boat here. If Europe is uh, the target today, the United States could easily be under attack tomorrow. Transatlantic cooperation on cybersecurity will help to maintain secure and open data flows between the United States and Europe. They are the world's highest after all. But that also depends on trust. Trust is easy to break and difficult to rebuild, as the world has seen with the recent case of Cambridge Analytica. If people feel their privacy has been violated, their digital profiles misused, then they will react accordingly. And when online trust is eroded, any digital economy will find it hard to advance. As you probably know, the EU's General Data Protection Regulation enters into full force next month. It will reinforce all our data protection rules, give people more control of their data, and set the rules on profiling and data portability. It will force companies to be more responsible and accountable in how they deal with our data. And it is practical. Companies will no longer have to follow 28 different country laws, just one for all of Europe. While it contains financial penalties for non-compliance, this is a last resort. We have to make sure that uh, the rules work in place. They are fit to tackle the constant hunger for increased monetization of data and targeted advertising. They have already changed how businesses deal with our data, and not only in Europe. Frankly, I would advise companies to invest in data privacy in the first place. Both the EU and US have a strong commitment in this area. Here, I'm thinking of the privacy shield. This makes sure that privacy is respected when the data of Europeans is sent to the United States. It is already being used by more than 2,700 companies, incidentally also by Cambridge Analytica. This just shows how crucial it is uh, for the privacy shield to be an effective and enforceable instrument. There is a lot still to be done, certainly in the United States. We are also closely following uh, the FTC's investigation into the Cambridge Analytica case. Artificial intelligence is another example. This technology is already with us globally and evolving fast. It raises issues of cyber 
security, privacy, ethics, as well as protection of fundamental liberties. These issues concern us all, which is why we should lay down some common principles on how artificial intelligence is developed and deployed. And we need to do this now. If we fail to do so, if the West fails to unify, we risk being exploited by those who would use cyberspace as a weapon to harm our free and open societies and economies. By not acting, we make ourselves an easy target. The perpetrators are operating on a global and daily basis, and that is not about to change. We have to fight it together to prevent, deter, and respond. Constant vig vigilance and cooperation. But it is not only about defeating threats. There is a lot to be positive about, especially when we work together. After all, this is about building a thriving transatlantic digital economy so that we all benefit. A bright global digital future. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Well, Vice President Ansip, thank you so much. Um, some of the key issues you've raised there are obviously the, the big challenges facing a unified digital strategy. Um, I guess, first of all, my, my question to you is, in the work you've been doing at the European Commission, um, how seriously do people take, at a, at a broad level, at a public level, how seriously do they take the risk of um, cyber attacks and infringement on digital security? I'm absolutely sure uh, because of WannaCry attacks, uh, because of uh, not uh, beta attacks, uh, people, they are taking more and more seriously uh, those uh, cyber threats. And uh, at least in Europe, people, uh, they got also a clear understanding that uh, uh, to tackle you know, those uh, threats, we uh, have to act together, we have to cooperate. Now, I'm going to go back to the situation you faced uh, 11 years ago in Estonia, um, almost to the day, 11 years. Um, fingers were pointed, but in, in your opinion, who was really behind the attacks? Yeah, we can guess who was behind of this, those attacks. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, we had to replace war monument, prone so, soldier from the city center to, to the cemetery, because uh, there were a lot of tensions about uh, around uh, those uh, this monument, uh, and uh, uh, those tensions uh, they were supported also by Kremlin, but. Um, there were two guys from Kremlin who stated that uh, uh, they were they were behind of those attacks. I myself, I I don't believe that those two guys from Kremlin organized those attacks. But if asked, uh, uh, we put them uh, on a blacklist, and uh, it means we banned banned uh, their entry to the European Union. So um, let's say. Two people, they said they were behind of those attacks. I guess but I think attribution is, um, is really important. Well, it's interesting, uh, uh, talking about trying to get a straight answer, um, sometimes out of the Kremlin, uh, John Major. Uh, John Major, the former British Prime Minister, tells a lovely story about how he went to visit Boris Yeltsin when he was president of Russia. And he said, there I was walking through the power, powerful corridors of the Kremlin, and I thought I must ask this man a tough question. He said. President Yeltsin, if you could describe the economy of Russia in one word, what would you say? And Yeltsin said, good. And he said, how can he say this? It's, it's falling apart, you know? So he said, all right, President Yeltsin, if you could use more than one word, what would you say? And he said, not good. So, <laughs> so perhaps uh, <laughs> it's not surprising you're having trouble getting a real answer. But, you know, but if, um, if state players like Russia or China are involved, 
um, in any way in these kind of uh, manipulations of digital security, cyber attacks or anything. How easy is it going to be to get a unified strategy? What you're trying to do obviously in Europe has to go global, doesn't it? We have to work together. I'm absolutely sure uh, no single country, it doesn't matter how big or small this country is, is able to deal with those issues alone. We have to join our forces, we have to cooperate because uh, uh, those cyber criminals, uh, uh, they're acting as an industry and uh, there is quite good cooperation between those uh, criminal groups. And uh, as a rule, uh, they are always able to hire better lawyers than uh, legal institutions. So um, we, we have to join our forces, we, we have to act uh, uh, together and uh, I think uh, in those days uh, people they have this clear understanding uh, how important it is to, to deal with the cyber security issues. But uh, it's not only about how we have to protect cyberspace, uh, it's also about our own people. Uh, I'm absolutely sure we have to pay much more attention on cyber hygiene. Too often our people, they think that uh, national church, uh, computer emergency response teams, ministers, uh, presidents, uh, uh, um, Symantec, uh, they are responsible for uh, cyberspace. Uh, they have to provide cyber security to our citizens, but uh, uh, according to some <laughs> research works, uh, uh, even 95% uh, from all uh, those um, uh, cyber incidents, cyber uh, attacks, uh, they were made possible by some uh, human errors. And it's possible to cut even 80% uh, of uh, those possible uh, DDoS attacks uh, when people they will pay uh, on minimum level attention on, on cyber hygiene. They will wash their hands in, in cyber space. Yeah. At least they will change uh, those uh, by uh, default factory security settings when buying uh, some uh, new devices or, or uh, connected devices. It's a generational thing as well, though, surely, and the pace of change is remarkable. I mean, I joined the BBC 25, 30 years ago, whatever, and we were still using typewriters. And I thought we were advanced because we had electric typewriters. So I'm wondering, um, with a younger generation, they, they seem to be far more savvy. Is it, are you building in, certainly with the European policy you're, you're heading up, are you building in a greater education of what, uh, what should be done, how people should be aware into the education system? Yes, of course, we, we have to uh, teach our people uh, starting uh, in kindergartens already. Uh, coding has to be part of curricula on, uh, in our school systems. Uh, but uh, I don't think it's, it's only about uh, coding. Uh, not everybody will be able to create uh, some algorithms. Uh, uh, when talking about cybersecurity, it's uh, about uh, our people and uh, they have to know how to use uh, those uh, very comfortable uh, digital public services uh, and uh, they don't have to know what is behind of uh, uh, those services but at the same time um, they have to pay uh, attention on, on cyber hygiene to change those uh, by default factory security settings for example it's somehow uncomfortable to to, to say that, uh, that the, when coughing, uh, you have to cover your, your mouth. But uh, in cyberspace, I think uh, this is uh, exactly what is, uh, what is really needed uh, today. Because, um, yeah, when talking about the Internet of Things, um, we know that uh, those bad guys here in the United States, uh, they were able to create two years ago botnets based on uh, uh, connected devices and uh, in this way they were able to generate quite uh, heavy uh, DDoS attacks and they, they were able to take down even uh, global uh, service providers. Uh, it seems to me that today it's, it's too easy to create uh, botnets based on uh, connected uh, devices. When buying uh, new uh, 
uh, mobile phone, for example, or iPad, uh, then uh, majority of people, they, uh, uh, they are ready to change uh, those uh, zeros into something else. Yeah. But uh, when buying uh, lamps, uh, which will be connected to the internet, or for this uh, uh, vacuum cleaner, uh, cleaning your apartment uh, when you are talking yeah. with me here, uh, then uh, people, they think that... Um, Let me just uh, check on it. Uh, it's, it's locked. No need to, to change uh, those uh, uh, security codes, but uh, it's dangerous. Yeah. It's dangerous for all of us. You're in a tough race, basically, because the dependence on the Internet of Things, our uh, connection to technology, is accelerating at such a rate, at such a rate, is the policy side, is, is the sort of governance side that you're trying to oversee, is that keeping up? It depends on country, of course. Um, when talking about Estonia, then um, uh, in my country, um, we decided that um, uh, we will not provide some state aid to our people to buy computers. We decided to provide more and more digital public services. And in this way, we created some kind of um, public demand. And uh, it was also part of uh, uh, education. Uh, people, uh, uh, they got an understanding about uh, some kind of uh, digital services. Let's take uh, e-prescription, for example. Um, for elderly people, it's a very comfortable solution. We used to invest uh, less than 1 million euros uh, to get the, this system uh, for the whole country. And of course, with this money, it was even small for small Estonia. Uh, we faced with uh, some technical complica complications. And of course, some people, they were against uh, uh, this system because they were Medical doctors, for example, they were afraid maybe it will be too easy to figure out uh, uh, what kind of pharmaceutical companies uh, I will really prefer and, and, and so on. But now it's, it's very popular. All the people, they say that, yes, this is something uh, I really wanted to have and, uh, and uh, I would like to get more that kind of uh, solutions. Those people, they don't know. What is behind of, of uh, this e-prescription system? They have to know that uh, uh, you, you can just call to your general practitioner and then you will get uh, your pharmaceuticals from every drugstore, even when visiting uh, your family members in some other cities. So it depends also on countries, right. how uh, much people they, they know about uh, cybersecurity issues, what is allowed, what is uh, not allowed, what is acceptable, what is not acceptable. Now, I, I, I wanted to get from you what the main lessons you've learned from that attack were uh, and how you applied them to the way you're moving uh, digital marketplace uh, integration forward. Uh, you set up a, a, cy a cyber defense unit, voluntary cyber defense unit in Estonia, correct? Yes, we did it, and uh, it wasn't a governmental initiative. When we faced with those cyber attacks, then of course we had our national cert, we had uh, our institutions in uh, place, and, uh, and they were really good at that time. But uh, informal cooperation between different uh, uh, national certs, it was crucial. We were able to cut majority of those attacks even before they crossed our borders. But informal cooperation between um, public sector and private sector was also crucial. There are highly educated people um, in private sector. Public sector will be never able to hire those people, but those people, they would like to act as uh, real patriots of their country. They would like to help their country. And more generally, there is always fight between good forces and bad forces. And some people, free of charge, they would like to support those good uh, forces. And I think it's, um, it's one of those lessons we learned uh, from that crisis. Uh, which is valid also today. Informal cooperation 
uh, between different institutions, between private sector and, uh, and public sector, it's definitely needed. And later on, those people who used to help our country, they decided that uh, they will continue with those uh, trainings and, uh, and they organized uh, a system in uh, our Def Defense League. It's uh, like uh, National Cards uh, in the United States of America. And uh, they're not paid for that, but uh, they would like to support good forces. I think uh, it's possible to copy, copy this example everywhere. Well, interestingly enough, um, what we have, as, as we're seeing in the media right now, um, the big companies being questioned about data privacy, about the way uh, people's information is used and the vulnerability that people might face. And I wonder um, if you feel that uh, it's possible to get some of the big players to say perhaps put aside commercial interests and create a better public-private partnership? Because that's sometimes the question. I don't want to blame on uh, global service providers. Uh, they, they are doing really well. Uh, but uh, when um, we have some problems, uh, then we, we have to fix those problems. I don't think uh, uh, some service providers, uh, they can be really happy when uh, uh, their customers, uh, they are totally unhappy. So um, I believe uh, those, uh, those problems uh, we are facing today in connection with uh, uh, Cambridge Analytica and Facebook, uh, uh, we will be able to find solution also for those problems. Yes, in the, in the European Union, somehow we were able to predict uh, uh, that uh, one day we will face that kind of uh, situations and uh, that's why we launched our general data protection uh, regulation. In Europe it's extremely important to protect everybody's privacy. We launched also uh, e-privacy regulation proposal and uh, yeah, I think it's a must to guarantee confidentiality of communication of our uh, people. So, we say it's, it's um, possible to, it's allowed to process uh, data of our citizens, but only on basis of people's consent. Mm. And this consent has to be an informed consent. If you would like to reach some targets, then you are ready to, to tick all the boxes. And uh, the, you don't know with what you, you agreed when, when ticking uh, those boxes. But um, informed consent is needed. It's uh, not correct to say that uh, we will make our people happy and their consent is, uh, is not needed at all. You can say also that uh, I will uh, take your money and make you happy without asking for your consent. Of course, uh, there is a small difference between money and uh, and data, data you can reuse, but, uh, but money when stolen, then uh, most likely you will not get back this money. But anyway, we ask our people's, we had to ask our people's consent. Right. Well, Europe at least has spent a few decades creating a framework for cooperation and interaction. Uh, how easy is it going to be to export the lessons of Europe in creating a, a digital single market uh, to, to other countries to perhaps incorporate that at a global level? At first, we, we have to create uh, a digital single, single market, market uh, in the European Union. Uh, sorry to say, but uh, this uh, digital single market does not exist yet. Mm. So, uh, more than 20 years ago, we were able to create uh, a single market in physical meaning. And all the member states, uh, they benefited from uh, uh, this uh, single market. Uh, if you can export your goods and services to other member states, uh, uh, and uh, there will be no barriers, uh, then um, it's beneficial uh, for our people, for our businesses. But um, uh, in digital world, uh, we can see how those barriers we were able to tear down once, uh, they, they are coming back every morning, those barriers, uh, they are higher and higher. And price of uh, non-Europe in digital meaning is huge. According to analysis uh, prepared by the European Parliament, uh, this is uh, uh, about 415 billion euros a year. We don't have this money, and message is clear. 
we have to create digital single market. And uh, in some areas, uh, yes, we were able to reach some aims already. For example, last June we were able to abolish roaming surcharges in the European Union. And in the United States people don't remember about roaming surcharges anymore, but in the European Union we have a generation of people who know how uh, dangerous it is to use uh, your mobile devices when traveling in some other yeah. EU member states. Not anymore. Yeah. So the low portability yeah. of the content. Yeah. Uh, if uh, you have legal access to some kind of digital content, uh, movies, um, TV series, music, e-books, audio books, uh, football, which is really important, uh, then that's the one with the now, like kick. Now it's so that when traveling in some other EU member states, uh, you will get access to your uh, legally bought uh, digital content. So it's um, it's big change. But um, uh, we are just um, negotiating about our, our proposals to create uh, this digital single market. But uh, I would like to underline once again, digital single market in the European Union, it's not about uh, protectionism. It's, it's good for everybody, also for American businesses, also for global businesses. Uh, if uh, they can... Uh, deal with one set of rules in the European Union, then it will be much easier than uh, to try to understand about uh, uh, those 28 different sets of rules. But especially it's, it will be good for our own small and medium-sized companies uh, for startups. For startups, for example, it's practically impossible to understand about uh, 28 different uh, sets of rules. Uh, uh, but now, and when they would like to scale up, then um, what they have to do. If we will continue in this way, then our message to our startups will be quite simple. Stay at home or go to the United States where they have single market with more than 300 million healthy mm -hmm. customers. We don't want to, se to send that kind of message to our startups. And that's why we will create this digital single market in the European Union. I was fascinated to read at the time of the attack uh, in Estonia, um, uh, your Ministry of Defense uh, security official there, uh, Tanel Sepp, uh, had an interesting quote. He said, it was a great security test. We just don't know who to send the bill to at the time of uh, this cyber attack. And I wonder if uh, there is also, in, in the path in terms of creating more cooperation, there's perhaps a, a route to creating greater action, uh, punitive action against those who initiate these kind of attacks, creating greater accountability uh, and, and indicating that this is something will not be tolerated. Attribution is, uh, is really important, as I said already. <clears throat> and uh, I'm happy that uh, uh, the United States of America in Europe also, uh, the United Kingdom, um, they named names in connection with the uh, WannaCry attacks, uh, in connection with the NotPetya attacks, and uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is extremely important, but uh, we have to understand that uh, um, it's a sensitive area. If uh, you will always name names, then uh, you will send an information about what uh, you know already and about uh, you don't know yet. Mm. And uh, in cyberspace, when talking about cyber espionage, for example, it can take uh, a year or even two uh, to understand uh, what kind of um, uh, tools they are using to get uh, to steal your information. and. Um, with attribution, you can um, easily, easily destroy work of uh, of many people. So, um, but anyway, in in case of murdering, we will never say that. Oh, it's too difficult to figure out uh, who did it. It's too costly to figure out who did it. Never ever, in meaning of prevention, it's extremely important to know who did it, and to send this guy to prison in cyberspace. Why we have to think that uh, if it's complicated, then we don't have to deal with those issues. We have to deal with those issues. 
So Vice uh, President Nansen, just a final thought with only about two minutes to go. How, do you, how optimistic do you remain that we're on the right track in achieving the goals you've, you've set? Optimism is our uh, moral duty, as, uh, as it was said by uh, Karl Popper, but uh, not because uh, only of uh, Karl Popper. But I think um, we can look forward uh, quite uh, optimistically. As I said, uh, there is quite co uh, good cooperation between the United States and uh, the European Union already. Uh, when talking about uh, new technologies, about uh, artificial intelligence, for example, then uh, there is also a common understanding that uh, uh, we have to, send, uh, to, to set uh, 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 common global uh, ethical principles uh, uh, because uh, it will be useful for, uh, for everybody, also for investors, uh, to understand uh, what is allowed, what is uh, not allowed. It's uh, too costly for investors, for example, if uh, they will create something and, uh, and then we will say that, uh, sorry, you created uh, a Frankenstein and, uh, and it's not allowed to use uh, this uh, in, in Europe. So uh, we have to work together. Artificial intelligence uh, is, uh, um, is already here. And uh, some people who are dealing with those issues uh, they think just about, uh, about efficiency, how to save uh, lives of our people, cancer di diagnostic, melanoma. So uh, if you will get um, assistance from uh, AI, then uh, it's possible to deal with those issues. Uh, it's possible to uh, increase productivity in agricultural sector, for example, when using artificial intelligence. It's good, according to those people. Some other people are thinking just uh, about singularity, about the day when uh, computers will uh, be smarter than human beings, and of course, uh, if smarter, they will, according to their understanding, uh, they Take will destroy uh, our planet, our atmosphere, and uh, um, it will be the end of the world. Those people, they have rights to be afraid, and uh, as we know, all practically all what was created by human beings. Uh, we can use in good purposes and in bad purposes. Knife you can use to cut cucumber, but you can kill some people. AI, the same story. You can use in good purposes, you can use also in bad purposes. Killer robots, etc. Uh, you know, some people, they are just thinking about that kind of stuff, and then we have to uh, provide security and, and peace uh, also to those people who are extremely worried about AI today. We have to work together. Well, to stay on that theme, I unfortunately have to terminate this interview because we've run out of time. <laughs> Vice President Anders Ansip, thank you so much, sir. Real pleasure. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you.